next uh, cranial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve, or the facial nerve. Its nucleus also lies in the pons. It's innervated from above bilaterally, and it's so-called bilateral supranuclear, above the nucleus innervation. And that has great clinical importance in distinguishing between an upper and a lower motor seventh or facial nerve palsy. The first thing you have to do, of course, is examine it properly. Now, observation in neurology, as I've stressed throughout this uh, demonstration, is, is key. So when you go along to someone and you say, hello, hi Danica, nice to meet you, and they shake hands, you're straight away looking at their face, their eyes, and looking around you to see are there any uh, accoutrement, if you will, that might suggest there may be a stroke, a walking difficulty, etc. So for example, if the person who is right-handed has a speech deficit and is unable to shake your hand, you'll all, you're straight for the face and you're looking for a, a right upper motor neuron seventh. And the, the diagnosis is more or less made there of a, a left-sided stroke. So the approach to the, facial po to, to the facial nerve, again, like the fifth nerve, involves motor, sensory, and reflexive elements. The motor ones are easy enough. Now, I find students tend to uh, like to jump in and start touching patients. A little bit odd, but uh, they do. So what I, what I ask them to do is not do so, if at all possible, and clarify the instructions they give. So the first thing I'd ask you to do, Danica, is raise up your eyebrows as high as you can, as if surprised. Fantastic. Now I want you to frown down as angrily as possible. Wonderful. Now, can you squeeze your eyelids really, really tightly shut? I always say, as if you've got soap in your eyes. So really tight, really tight. Now, I might touch your face at this stage. I'm going to tell you, though, I'm going to try and open your right eyelid, so don't let me. Now, plenty of warning. Patients get frightened fairly easily, easily, so understandably, if someone's coming at them and touching their face, and you can open your eyes. Now I want you to show me your teeth. Right back, if you will. You don't ask them to smile. It's a reflexive thing. So just show me your teeth. That's fine. And can you blow out your cheeks? Fine. So that's, they are the muscles of facial expression. Surprise, frowning, smiling, or mimicking smiling. And they're supplied by the seventh cranial nerve. That's the motor aspect. The sensory aspect is taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And the posterior one-third, as we'll see, is via the glossopharyngeal nerve but taste the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Now, first of all, you notice, you ask the patient, say, have you noticed any change in your sense of taste? Not in your taste, but in your sense of taste. Okay, I'm going to briefly try and test that at the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and usually I would use uh, salt and sugar. I won't tell you which, Danica, uh, but I use salt and sugar, and what I will do is, I'll ask Danica to open your mouth and stick out your tongue. Stick out your tongue, thanks. And now, very gently, I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to put an object on the side of your tongue there. Make sure I don't give you too much. And I want you to tell me what that is. Is it salt or sugar? Sugar. Okay, so in, I mean, I don't want to over the point, but in, in fact you put a salt on one end of a spatula, sugar on the other, if you really need to formally test it. Of course, in practice, we rarely, if ever, do. The other question you might ask in the setting of a seventh nerve is about hyperacusis, and that means an increased sensitivity to noise. The reason for this is, in someone with a lower motor neuron seventh nerve palsy, uh, it may affect the nerve to stapedius, which amazingly pulls on the muscle stapedius, which then pulls on the stapes, which is one of the middle ear bones. So if you lose the pull of the uh, stapedius muscle on the inner ear bones, you lose the dampening down effect from the tympanic membrane to the round window, and thus loud noises become particularly severe, hence hyperacusis. You might get a loss of taste, as we've just discussed, and these would normally be in the setting of a lower motor neuron seventh. So as a clinical key point, you have to distinguish between an upper and a lower motor neuron seventh. The upper is from the cortex to the nuclei in the pons. The lower is from the pons through the cerebellar pontine angle, out via the stylomastoid foramen here, into the parotid, and you'll all remember the five branches that come from the parotid of the facial nerve. The easiest way to remember the difference between an upper and a lower motor neuron seventh is what cosmetically you would prefer yourself if you had a seventh nerve palsy. And the answer is an upper, because the upper motor neuron uh, will spare the upper face because of what I mentioned earlier, this bilateral supranuclear innervation. What that means is the nuclei are supplied from above the nuclei from both sides. And as a result of that, there's a little bit of compensation for the upper part of the face in an upper motor neuron lesion. However, in a lower motor neuron lesion, particularly a Bell's palsy or that due to a zoster infection called Ram Ram Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, the whole face is affected. And that looks cosmetically a lot less, a lot more severe, if you like. Um, in the setting of, as we mentioned with the fifth nerve, in the setting of a Bell's palsy, you lose the um, corneal reflex response on that side. So in other words, as we showed earlier on, but uh, just to repeat, when you put cotton wool on the side, this eye will blink, but a left Bell's palsy will prevent 
this eye from blinking, and the eye may become injected and infected, so one should always cover that eye in the acute setting and indeed add eye drops thereafter. So the reflexive part of seven is the efferent branch of the um, corneal reflex, which I won't repeat, it was shown on the fifth nerve uh, examination earlier.